so that we can back Okay, all right, go thank ahead. you. Okay, so, uh, so the title of this talk, Pearl Syntactic Legacy, um, Using the Future to Improve the Past. Um, some of you might, uh, I'll speak louder, yes. Um, uh, so, so obviously, legacy is in the title. A lot of you are probably thinking this definition. Uh, old software, all that. We like to make fun of Pearl 5 being old and all that stuff. Um, but I was actually also thinking about this definition. Okay, uh, you know, Larry has moved on to Pearl 6. Uh, Pearl 5 has become sort of our collective legacy. We all use it. Um, we, well, some of us use it every day, some of us don't. Uh, but we all use it. So, so Pearl 5 is ours nowadays. And actually, I want to correct something here. Um, Larry is actually kind of handing stuff down from the future. Uh, a lot of the new features in Pearl 5 are actually come from Pearl 6. Um, so just a little correction there. Um. <laughs> Anthony, it's, I like that picture. It's very laid back. Um, so um, legacy is actually a subtext of this talk. Um, as I go through it, I'll, I'll point out some legacy stuff there. But I want you to sort of dig out the legacy <laughs> stuff in there. Um, what this talk actually more is about is, uh, is about the evolution of a design um, and the slow breakdown of my own stubbornness. Um, and, you know, <laughs> that right there is sort of learning. Um, what is learning other than the act of realizing how dumb, or the present you realizing how dumb the past you was, okay? And when you learn and you recognize that, you can learn from your mistakes. So really quickly, a little bit of data about myself. Um, uh, that's my CPAN ID, uh, that's the email address I like to use these days, my GitHub, uh, my Twitter. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I got started in this racket in 1998. Um, I built a website for $500, which is $726.74 if uh, we throw inflation into it in 2014 dollars. <laughs> um, and I actually did deliver a copy of the website on a three and a half inch floppy, okay? In 2002, uh, I got a job learning Perl. Um, at first, I really didn't like it, no offense, Larry. Um, but I didn't like it, and I kept trying to mold it and twist it into uh, the other languages that I like. Um, and then actually, I stepped back, and I, r I realized, wait a second, Perl is really, really flexible. I can actually make it look like Java. I can program Fortran in Perl. I can do all these things because Perl is so flexible. And from there, I promptly fell in love with Perl. Um, I contributed my first CPAN project in 2004. Um, shortly thereafter, maybe one or two <coughs> projects after, was actually a project called Class Trait, which I did with Curtis. Um, and uh, he was, you were actually probably, I realized the other day, you were probably one of the first people in the Perl community that I actually interacted with online. So, all his fault. <laughs> he could have driven me away. He didn't. Um, <coughs> but Class Trait was an implementation of uh, the roles paper which was the paper that uh, inspired roles in, or I'm sorry, class trait is a trace <laughs> paper which inspired roles in Perl 6. Um, so I've been hacking on sort of meta model -y, object -y model stuff for a while. Um, in 2005, I got involved in the Pugs project, which was an attempt to sort of write uh, Perl 6 in Haskell. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a really great project, a lot of velocity. Um, one of the things that I'd spent a lot of time in there was working on the meta model. So I really kind of fell in love with, uh, with Perl 6 object which when I went back to Perl 5, I didn't have. Uh, so I wrote Moose, um, and that was about 2006. Um, then in 2011, I started a project, which is what we're gonna talk about in this talk. Uh, I've started a project to try and take some of the learnings that we had from Moose, uh, things that went well, things that didn't go well, um, and also to take some of the, uh, you know, even more ideas potentially from Perl 6 to actually try and bring those into the Perl 5 core and see if we couldn't actually sort of uh, upgrade the, uh, the meta model. Now, um, who here knows what a MOP is when I say this word? Okay, we got some people, but not everybody. So quick review. Um, a MOP is basically an API to these things, okay? So your classes, your methods, your attributes, your instances, basically everything that makes up object-oriented programming. It's important to note, too, the uppercase. So there's a big difference between lowercase class and an uppercase class. Uppercase class is the class that represents classes, whereas lowercase class is essentially an instance of that. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Also, too, I like to describe it as this. Um, usually when my mom asks me, like, what is it that you do again? This is what I tell her. Um, and then she doesn't bother asking me any more questions after that. Um, but if you think about it, it's an abstraction. So the mop is an abstraction. 
used to build or uh, it's an abstraction of a system of abstractions. That system of abstractions is your classes, your methods, other things like that that you then in turn use to build your abstractions, which are your programs and your classes. So it gets very, very deep, very, very abstract, and very, very meta, but it's a lot of fun. Um, some of you may or may not know this, but Perl 5 actually has a built-in mop already. Um, the syntax can be a little awkward at times, but the fact is that it, it is a mop there, and you can really can do it. This is getting hot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's bad enough I'm going to sweat already. But uh, So you, you can actually do a lot with this, and we actually built Moose on top of this. We built several prototypes on top of this. So it's, it's pretty powerful. It does tend to get a little bit awkward. It's difficult to read and things like that. So. Um, so anyway, uh, I started this project, I called it P5MOP, just because P5 is a nice little uh, thing, the differentiator on, on GitHub, um, and so we called it that. Here's a basic list of the goals. So we set out with a base set of goals that we wanted to accomplish. The details of it, you'll see, kind of get fuzzy along the way, but these are the base goals <coughs> that we wanted to do. The first thing, first and foremost, one of the things that drives me the most insane about Perl 5 is there's no way to declare what is going to be in your class. So the idea of a class attributes, yeah, fields. Well, I'm sorry, you're right, Ricardo. All right, never mind, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> if I had only known. And wait, pseudo hashes too. Um, so uh, there's, no, there's no nice way to, to declare your, your, your attributes and your slots. Um, so I wanted to bring that into there. Um, and I'll show you an example of why that's really important. Um, classes and methods and packages and subs, like. There's no distinction, but there kind of is. It all depends on how you use it, things like that. That can be confusing, especially for new people coming into the language, especially for people who are familiar to the word package, meaning something entirely different in other languages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, role composition. So one of the things that I think was one of the biggest successes out of Moose was uh, the use of roles. And, and, and we've since had uh, other modules that have been written and built, uh, role tiny, things like that, to, uh, to bring it along, not with Moose, uh, but it's basically one of, the, one of the more successful features that we had. And it's actually very important. This distinction becomes very important when you're doing things like role composition. Um, so it's maybe less important in other cases, but certainly in there. Um, an introspection API. Um, I really like the ability to, to look, at, look at sort of what's going on in there and, and get some introspection. You can, you can do a lot of meta programming with that and stuff like that. So the, the type blob uh, API can get very, very messy when you do that. So it's nice to have a nice, clean, object-oriented API. And then sort of last but not least is I thought, well, we should also maybe improve the objects, uh, the OO syntax a little bit. This is a lot where we start to borrow from Perl 6. Um, so quick, a quick run through of sort of what it, what, what it could look like. Uh, here's your standard profile class. Um, that was uh, the initial proposal. There's some been some changes and some tweaks to it, <coughs> but this roughly gives you the idea of, of the initial proposal. It looks very, very much like Perl 6. Like I said, we stole a lot from them um, for that. So clear things here. Packages are there, classes are here, okay? Very different. You know they're different. There's no ambiguity in that. Uh, subs, are they subs? Are they methods? I don't know. For you, Rick, you can differentiate them, except for Perl doesn't give a shit about this. <laughs> you can still call them as subs if you want. And if you don't put it there, you can still call those methods. So as much as this will mark it, it won't actually make any distinction. Here, very clear, it's a method. There's no ambiguity. Constructors. We all write our own constructors. Why do we write our own constructors? Because Perl has no idea what we're actually putting in our class, okay? This goes back to attributes. The ability, if you can define these out there, then look, there's no constructor. You don't need one. The, 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 the runtime can actually figure it out for you because it knows all the information that it needs to know. And then lastly, and this one really is for Rick, because he obviously, you know, the, the whole 50% might spell it the right way, might spell it not. This, you would probably have a hard time misspelling this, I would imagine. I would put a Z there, you know, that would be me. Um, but, you know, field names in our, in our classes, they're hash keys. Um, and it's very easy to do a typo on that, especially if you're using it a lot and you're doing it everywhere. And you're in a rush, and the production server is down, or, or something, or something, something. One of the key things about the proposal that we had put in there was we wanted these to actually be lexical variables um, or some variation of a lexical variable. The idea being that that's compile time checkable. So there is no more typos. They're gone because it's a compile time check. If, that, if, it's, if it hasn't been specified already, we don't see it, we don't know it, and Perl naturally catches it. So that was the rough bits of our PFOP my proposal. So here's the story of the design. <coughs> so 
who started out on the journey, probably you'll recognize some of these pictures. Um, it didn't look that bad, right? It's just, it's just follow that red line. It's all right. It's no big deal. Sure. Within a few days, we had a nice prototype, but you know, we, we were starting to get pretty far away. We, we felt like we were making progress. We picked up a few co-conspirators along the way. People gathered around on the project. We kept going. We started getting higher and higher and higher. We, okay, we're, we're doing good. We're getting there. Things started to get a little rocky. Um, we ran into things like the fact that it's pretty much impossible to, you, can, you can't dispatch on anything other than a package and a blast reference in Perl 5. It's just, it's, it's too tricky. But thankfully along the way, we run into guys like this uh, who would offer their wisdom every once in a while. Um, we would plateau. We'd get to various places, but we were actually getting really, really, really far away from sort of the base of uh, Perl 5. Um, and when we actually took a step back, we were only halfway, okay? Further out, starts to look very imposing, starts to look really, really imposing, starts to actually almost maybe a little scary um, at this point, but we reached our top. So we celebrated, and we celebrated, and we celebrated, and we celebrated, <laughs> and I'm not even really sure what happened at this point, but <laughs> we, 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 must, we must have been celebrating. Um, then the next day, we woke up, we started hacking a little bit more, and this is actually, I actually took this picture because we had spent so long finding the bug and I wanted to just immortalize it because it was such an evil little bug, okay? I won't get into the exact details of it. If you want to know, you have to get me drunk first. Um, <coughs> but the thing, <laughs> yes, that is a challenge, Matt. Not for you though, somebody else. <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing was is, we had managed to get all the way to the top, and we didn't realize that the, the trip down to the bottom was pretty bad. So, so we had, it was fun. We got there, and it was good. And, and as I mentioned, this is, uh, so that narrative was a little stretched out, because uh, Salva and the Oslo Pearl Mongers actually put on a hackathon for us in Prekestolen. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And Salva and I were actually just talking, saying, we didn't tell enough people about it. So that was me telling that. So if you see Salva, Buy him a beer, for sure, <laughs> okay? So anyway, back, back to the actual story. Um, so uh, the first version basically suffered under the weight of its own complexity, okay? We were having a lot of fun, which sometimes is a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. Uh, the bootstrap was like ridiculously pedantic. It bootstrapped along the way, tied knots, all these various places. It was really, really, really tricky to understand to the point where if you walked away from it for about an hour, you'd have to spend four hours to get your head back into it, in it which is not a good sign. We had strict meta-class incompatibility. Does anybody know what meta-class incompatibility is? Right, exactly, you don't fucking really care. <laughs> it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, we had a mop that was bootstrapped with the mop. We had a mini mop that bootstrapped the real mop and then they did this and did this. And that was actually really awesome if it was just like a PhD we were writing for <laughs> some class. It was not very maintainable. Um, and the key things was that <coughs> we, it was dumb of us, but we, like I said, we were having fun. We didn't focus on testing with real world, da real world data, okay? <laughs> That's the first rule of optimization. Make sure you're testing against real world data. It's also the first rule of prototyping, okay? Make sure you're testing things with, we had a huge test suite and none of it actually tested recursion, recursive method calls. And that was what that bug was that I showed before, is it, it, they, they didn't work. And I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Um, and also, too, we kept punting the idea of, like, how would this integrate with, with your standard Perl 5 OO classes? We kept saying, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. And then we got to the point where we realized we had no yet clue how to get there. Um, and the, the, the idea, in a lot of ways, was to try and build a system that did not uh, have to touch much of the legacy that was in Perl 5. Uh, for the simple idea was that it's very complicated. It's spaghetti-ish at times. Um, but the fact is, in order to keep that distance, we ended up having to dig really, really deep into the core of Perl 5. Just to avoid some legacy, we ended up having to di dive into some of the most, uh, the, the, the most tangly bits of the legacy. And we forgot the first rule of prototypes. Always throw the first one away, always. Um, and the second rule of prototypes, never use pad walker, <laughs> never. <laughs> So that's what that thing was, is we had the, we had the re recursive methods and we were trying to inject in the, the, those uh, lexical variables for the attributes and including a self in there. We were trying to inject that in with Padwalker. 
Tad Walker got really confused after a while and just started just saying, well, you gave me something, I'll give you something else back. <laughs> um, but so, you know, it, 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 it was a learning experience, um, and, and as, as all prototypes will be. Um, but in the post-mortem of this, we actually started to really think, we had created a pretty big mess, um, and, and there was a real question there that we weren't really addressing, weren't really thinking is, who the hell would want to maintain this, okay? So we had this really fun, complicated, interesting, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but it was just, it was difficult for us to even continue on. Forget about dumping this on P5P. Um, I imagine Rick would have just said no. Um, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> we need to talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, damn it, yeah. Um, so, so uh, you know, after this, we, we myself and the, my co-conspirators, we, we, we did a lot of talking, we did a lot of discussing. We basically decided to table it for a little while and see where we'd go. Um, the next step in the road, uh, because once you start asking yourself, should it even be in core? The next logical step, of course, is, well, let's just rewrite the core. <laughs> so, <coughs> it's logical, right? You guys agree with me. Um, so at uh, the Orlando Pro Workshop, um, because you can do things like this at the Orlando Pro Workshop, I, I, I gave a very hyperbolic presentation uh, in which I basically called for the idea of like, let's, let's, let's experiment and rewrite uh, the Pearl Core. And let's do it in Scala too, which was kind of crazy. Um, I was gonna call it Larry, but I asked Larry and he was like, please don't. <laughs> so, uh, but he suggested let's call it Mo. So we called it Mo. Um, now, one of the things that I wanted to do with this project was we were, I, I had had a lot of fun on the Pugs project. And the Pugs project was optimized for fun, okay? We never meant it to be a serious version of Perl 6. Um, we just wanted it to be an experimentation tool. Uh, a lot of it was for Larry, so Larry could actually test out some of the language features, stuff like that. So I wanted to sort of take the same uh, uh, approach and see where we could go. Um, several people in the Perl community were skeptical about this. They, they, they didn't really think it was a good idea. Um, this was my wish list. I thought, hey, this is really simple. These things are pretty straightforward, <laughs> um, right? It's, it's not that hard. Um, so I actually started hacking on stuff. I, like I said, I wanted to learn Scala in case I needed to get a job at Twitter or something. Um, <laughs> and, but at the same time, I was doing a little bit of research because I was gonna give a talk. Um, and I was trying to see, well, what, what, what is the actual impact of all this? <laughs> CPAN. <laughs> when you get rid of excess, you might as well just get rid of CPAN, okay? As much as that sort of is a painful reality, it is the reality. You can pretty, you can guarantee that just about every, uh, every CPAN module you touch, even if you think it's per pure Perl, somewhere, somewhere down the way is something that may not even be directly access, but it directly relies upon the API, APIs that are inside of Perl, okay? It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a twisty chain that always lands you back into there. And too, some of the things we were talking about getting rid of, um, uh, autoload. Auto load is evil. It's, it's useful in some context, but it's generally evil. You get rid of that, you lose LWP, okay? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> you get rid of tie. Everybody can agree that tie is sort of a slow, weird, quirky feature. Again, useful when it's useful, really a bad idea when it's most every other time. Um, you get rid of tie, you get rid of DBI. Could any of you live without DBI? No, exactly. Um, Right, exactly. Oh, oh, oh. Can somebody have this man ejected, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Mongo dev room is over there, Matt. <laughs> so, at this point, we were really basically running into the syntactic legacy, okay? So much of, of CPAN, which is, which is sort of our, our, our killer app, okay, our killer feature, so much of that was written in what, what we might now call bad features or, or maybe a, a poor choice of features, but at the time made sense. If you sit down with Tim Bunce and talk to him about why he chose uh, uh, Ty, I bet he has a really good reason. I've never done it, but I bet he has a really good reason why, okay? If you, it, you, you basically very quickly run into this kind of stuff on core modules that are really important. So despite all that, I still kept hacking. Um, so this is actually the test suite of Mo uh, at the end of uh, uh, Yapsi North America 2000 and whatever. Um, and, and actually, it was a, we, had, we had all this sort of stuff going on, but we totally moved way beyond the possibility of being, bringing it back into core. Um, but it was still fun, so we were still hacking on it anyway. And I probably would have continued if not for this talk. Have any of you watched this talk on YouTube or seen the talk? Okay, so Pete Martini was uh, one of the 
And you can see really, a lot of, in a lot of ways, Rick, correct me if I'm wrong here, the catalyst kind of behind a lot of the subsignature stuff. He kept it going. He kept it alive. He didn't actually, he wasn't actually the person who did the final implementation, but still, it really was, it was him that kept it going and kept the discussion going and actually arrived at something, uh, sort of forced the arrival of something that was good. So I actually sat in on this talk, and I was pretty hungover, but I still paid attention. <laughs> um, and I was impressed by a couple things that Pete did. First, he dug deep, okay? Apparently, signatures have been planned since 1995. We just haven't gotten around to them yet, until now, okay? But there was a specific thing saying they're, they're a planned feature <coughs> in the future. Pete also, and the nice thing about this talk, too, is he did mix technical stuff, but he also talked a lot about the process. Of, of getting a feature in and, and the process of going through profile, uh, profile portal. Um, and these are the four broad objections. And he goes over each one in detail. Uh, again, watch the talk if you want to see it uh, for real. But the one I want to focus on is this one, because I think this is a great, great sort of uh, idea here. And it's not something I would ever have ever thought of, but Pete actually explained it. And he explained it is basically, you put a feature into pro profile, Couple people use it, maybe it's an experimental feature, whatever. <laughs> Eventually, the feature goes out there, people start using it. CPAN modules start to rely on it. And you start to rely on the CPAN module. Okay, you begin to get a long tail here. Chances are this actual release doesn't end up in, in distros, in Unix distros, until maybe two, three years down the road. So at that point, you know, people have started to put some bug fixes together, things like that. Are we even thinking it's a bad idea still? Maybe we've already decided it's a bad idea, but now it's on every Linux distro out there and we're stuck with it. Um, and then also too, the idea of, again, who's gonna maintain this stuff? You threw in a feature and then you left. Well, who's gonna do it? So it's important, and Peter really expanded on it in, 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 in a pretty good amount of detail to say like, you have to really think about these things, not just the technical aspects, but the social aspects and, and, and the sort of the wider reach of these things. Um, he then went on to actually talk about the implementation and things like that. Um, this isn't a screenshot from that. This is just him, him talking about how weird things are. Um, but uh, I was really impressed both with the homework that he had done, the amount of time he had spent wading through P5P and sort of figuring out a lot of stuff. Um, but then also when he got into the details of, of the core, I realized how little of the core I really understood. And so I, I, I took that with me um, and, and on the way home, in the airport, I started to think, well, maybe I should try this again. Um, because I saw what Pete did, and, and, and it really inspired me to try this again. So the first thing I wanted to do was to make sure that I didn't make the same mistakes last time. <laughs> so I started out with this prototype. One of the key features <coughs> was that whole lexical variables down there. So I thought, can I do this in a way that doesn't involve pad Padwalker, that doesn't involve all sorts of craziness and, and screwiness, and instead of trying to design it sort of from the top down, like, this is what I want, and how am I going to make it? I decided to come from the bottom up, to start thinking about that legacy and start thinking about that old Perl core and try and come up with how, how can I, what, what will be the de-sugared syntax for this? Um, so the first thing, field hashes, uh, was it 510, right? Is that what came up? So 510, how many know about field hashes? Wow. Field hashes were sort of put in there for the, the inside out object idea. And what they do is they basically register an ID of the, the, the hash that you have in there and then you can use it. So in inside out objects, you have to explicitly destroy, have a destroy that cleans out uh, your, 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 uh, your inside out hashes. Field hashes does that for you, so you don't have to use it. So I, I, I thought, okay, I can maybe use this technique a little bit. Can you look at the inside? Yeah, well, you don't, you don't ever want to look at the inside of <laughs> some of these features. Um, variable magic. Variable magic exposes uh, in a core Perl feature, which are the magic V tables, which are basically, you can attach these to variables and they will, uh, at certain events inside the variables, it'll fire uh, <laughs> other things. It's also a way to, to pass data around. And this, and what you do with it on the Perl side roughly maps to uh, the C struct that you create when you're doing internal stuff. Um, and so, this is how with inside out objects, you get out your data for your instance. So I got that, great. But of course it's a copy, so any changes I make don't work. That's where the magic comes in. With this caching, you're passing in where you're actually storing it and the instance, so that allows you to fetch that data in there. And then you're caching onto the variable, and then this kind of crazy weirdness, because I had to fit in a slide so I couldn't make it nice. Um, that crazy weirdness basically ensures that anytime I set that variable, uh, the, 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 the lexical variable, 
it'll actually write back to the store. So this works, and it works with recursion, which was the important part, because um, it didn't work <laughs> last time. Um, and so if you think about this, it's not that hard to move, there you go, to move to something like this, okay? It's just really to, to it's a desugaring of this kind of syntax. Because we just basically had a method preamble here that we would have to inject into the method. And then we had to basically make that my field hash stuff look a little bit nicer, okay? So, so to go from one to the other wasn't too, what didn't seem like it would be that much of a stretch. Um, okay. um, so I sat in the airport, hacked on this for a little while, and it was really a different approach. It was going from the bottom up. And, and that was sort of the key to it. And it started to have early successes. I didn't say a word to anybody for a while because I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't basically heading down the same ways. Um, I even did later add some uh, uh, syntax into it. Um, I used Adele Declare at first. Um, if anybody's used that, they'll know what that means in the middle there. <laughs> um, but we, again, we were trying very carefully to, to very step it very slowly and sort of see. And by this point, I had picked up some token security. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did was keep it simple, okay? This is a favorite quote of mine. Um, but the funny thing is, is that's not really what he said. That was someone paraphrasing him. This is actually what he said, <laughs> which admittedly is not that simple. But if you think about it, if you're trying to basically come up with theory for the grand, you know, to relate everything in the universe, you're allowed a little bit of complexity. Um, so I tried to keep this balance. This is something that I tried to keep in my mind throughout the whole, this, this sort of next phase of the prototype was I need to keep that balance of simplicity um, but I need to allow for complexity where it's, where it's necessary. Um, the other thing that we tried really, really hard to not make the same mistake twice was the using the real world data. Um, so uh, very early on, <laughs> <laughs> we ported Plaque because Plaque is actually, it's a really, really well-written module by Miyagawa over there. Um, very nice, very good, yes, thank you. It's a very clean, cleanly written. Uh, it's it's simple, where it needs to be complex, where 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 it needs to be. So it's sort of a nice thing that we could use as as sort of a, a barometer to see like how successful is what we're doing. And so I actually spent about a week porting Plaque to the P5 MOP. It took a week for the simple fact that I kept running into things that I hadn't implemented yet. And so I had to build it and build it and build it. And I thought you know there was some doubts at various times that maybe this wouldn't work out, but ultimately uh, it did. And so we ported a couple other modules, that, that. Breadboard was the first Moose module that I tried to port, which made me realize how fucking crazy some of the features that I added in Moose were. Um, REPL was uh, a reply, is uh, if, if you need a, a REPL, I highly recommend that. It was a former coworker of mine, Jesse Lures, and also a Moose maintainer and one of my co-conspirators on this. He wrote that, it's a very, very nice full featured REPL. Um, and we got, uh, we actually got some contributions from other, from other people. Um, Action retry is uh, Dams. I don't remember who Ford Ruth, Ruth was. I don't remember the guy who did it. Forward. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah, forward. Okay, so whoever forward is. Um, uh, action retry, hash ID, um, and uh, this was, I think, uh, Paul Bennett. So we basically encouraged some people out there to do stuff, and they actually gave us some feedback and said, this was really weird, that was really odd. So we had a prototype. It certainly was not ready to go in the core, but we had we'd, we'd worked out a lot of these details. So much so that we actually put it on CPAN. Um, I never remember the URL for this, so uh, and you can't find it in the search. I don't know why. So maybe the Meta CPAN API folks can fix that. Um, but so uh, we put it up there. Uh, you know, we had a lot of we did our best to put in some some stuff there, and we actually <laughs> spent a lot of time. We actually removed all the dependencies um, down to just one, which was Devel Call Parser which is the sane version, for some value of sane, uh, versus uh, de uh, Devel Declare. Um, and so we had all that stuff in there, and we moved a bunch of stuff actually into XS already as a means of trying to speed certain things up. Um, now, I consider that a success, that, that particular uh, version of the prototype, but it is not the last version. Um, one of the things that we found is, again, as much as we had tried to build bottom up, we weren't low enough. We hadn't gone into the sub-basement yet, which is the Pearl Core, which is the scary stuff. Um, and what we had built was really, it, the, the, the excess 
that we had in there was not a foundation of which everything else could sit. So we've sort of backported things down into excess. So this we had the learnings from the first one. I had the learnings personally from, from just running off in a crazy direction trying to implement my own thing. Um, but then we had uh, this. It was successful in a number of ways, but it still was, was not quite there. Um, there were dark times. I had to do it. I had avoided it for so long, but I had to do it. I really, really had to sit down. I really, really had to learn the core. And there's some power in there. Dark, deep, ancient power. But it's there. I highly recommend this book. Um, it's very appropriate if you live in Amsterdam. Um, uh, but I dug through a lot of stuff. Uh, Stefan Mueller uh, helped guide me through a lot of stuff. Um, uh, the, uh, this book, uh, the docs, and then actually doing some code diving. As, as scary as that sounds, once you kind of get your head around some stuff, it's actually not that bad. Um, it's, it's still horrendous, and don't ever expand macros. Never expand macros in the core. It's really, that, that'll make you cry. Um, but, so I spent a lot of time with this, and I'm not going to go into details, because mo most of these things just ended up seg faulting in the end anyway. Um, but I learned a lot, which led me to this. <laughs> that is the actual project name. Um, it started out as a joke on my local drive, and then I was like, fuck it, I'm going to put it on GitHub as this. Um, because I think it's appropriate. Um, <coughs> one of the things Pete talked about in his talk um, that I actually didn't really uh, uh, digest until much later <coughs> was uh, he, he talked at the end about incrementally adding features. Um, and actually since, uh, since this talk, Pete and I, Pete, I used to live in not too far from the New York area and Pete lives on the other side of the New York area. Um, and we would meet for lunch every once in a while and talk. He has a lot of plans for subroutine signatures. But he wasn't putting them in first. He wanted to do this incrementally. And that's very smart. And that's especially really, really smart in a large legacy. I brought the word again. Uh, legacy code base like Perl. Um, and so the, the, and the interesting thing about that is that you're actually optimizing for success. Because the, the, the less change that you do, the more likely that it's going to get in and the more likely it's going to not break, or no, the, more, the less likely it will break other stuff. Um, so with that in mind, I actually started hunting around in the Perl core to see. And I started actually thinking about all the features that I wanted in a little bit more detail and trying to figure out, well, what can I do um, that, uh, wh what, what can I do without any work? Um, and I'm going to take a quick digression here. Um, and this is actually a brand new slide. Um, Rick and I went down to the Ada dev room. Um, Woohoo, Ada! Um, uh, Ada, if you don't know, is a, a, a language invented by the U.S. Department of Defense, which has got to be awesome, right? Um, it's meant for killing people. Um, so it's actually meant for real-time systems, um, missiles, nuclear reactors, things you don't want to fail. Um, and uh, the guy made a point in this about uh, object orientation in Ada or in Ada, 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 whatever. Um, it's done basically as a combination of a feature they call variant records or tag records and packages. Um, and they've added some syntactic sugar over the years to sort of make it nicer, but the fact of the matter is there's no, or at least so this guy said, there's no true object orientation in the same way that we think of it with classes and stuff like that uh, in Ada. Instead, it's a pattern. It's a pattern that they all know how to follow, and that's actually laid out in the spec, I'm sure. Um, but it's a pattern. If you think about it, Perl object orientation is the same thing. What's a packages, subs? What about methods and class? No, it's a pattern that we all have adopted and follow. Okay, so it's a de design pattern. Now, if you think about that, there's potentially a lot of stuff that's in the core Perl right now that we can use. Maybe we adopt it as new patterns. Maybe we wrap some nicer syntax around it. Who knows? That's for later. Um, but there's a lot in there that can be used, and and so. These slides talk about that. How many of you know about this feature, a bodyless sub? Yeah. Okay. When, when did that come out? Uh, yeah, yeah. It was. It's. It's been around. It's been around for a long time. How many people use it in their code? Okay. That's about as. It's more than I expected. But but. Um, <coughs> if you're familiar with Moose and with roles, we have a concept in roles of required methods. Basically, a method that your consuming class has to implement. And we, 
we don't, we're, we're, you, you're not providing an implementation of it, you're just saying you have to have this if you want to compose this role into your class. So these can be required methods. And you know what? As much as they're really not, you can't figure that out from the outside, the root, okay? So this is the root of, of where the, uh, the op tree uh, starts is null. So from the XS side, I can figure that out. So suddenly, wow, I, now I have required methods implemented. This, again, nobody does it because, well, it's friggin' useless because Perl doesn't actually, do, doesn't actually uh, uh, enforce that in any way. But lo and behold, it's there. You can get to it, okay? Signatures. This is the best thing about fucking up the first couple of prototypes because it takes a little while and then somebody puts signatures into the core and this is your change. Ta-da. That's my diff, that's the actual diff. Um, these three pieces, I haven't done a thing. Already got them, they're already there. Okay, so there's a lot actually in there and it took me a long time. And again, like I said, this is a slow breakdown of my own stubbornness. Okay, I didn't see these features because I was too, too focused on the fancy and the shiny at the other end. If you want to take this, you can take this one step further. Uh, roles. Where do you store the roles that have been applied to your class? Well, is it is just fine for inheritance. Why not do the same thing for roles? Okay, the syntax is not pretty. I'm not proposing this as the syntax. I'm proposing this as the implementation. Okay, put it in there. How do I make that actually take effect? Well, magic. The same thing, it is a has magic attached to it. The is array has magic attached to it. So when you do certain things to it, it causes certain things to happen in the Perl internals. In theory, you could do the same thing here. Uh, class attributes, we talked about before. If package level storage is good enough for that, why not this, okay? We've got the keys that we wanna have available. We have an initializer to create a default in there. One of the nice things is this default will actually tell you, if you actually look inside this sub, it'll tell you what package it was defined in, which means I can identify what package these subs, which I'm hard associating with that, came from, which means I can also use Perl 5, the same trick that Perl 5 uses for method caching. So if you don't know, the stash of your package, which is where all the methods are stored, is essentially a hash. It's kind of a funky hash, but it's essentially a hash. The way a lot of the method caching works is it actually sticks. W once you call a method, it says, well, I didn't see that locally and I had to go find it. Let me stick something in the method cache. And then there's obviously ways for that Perl to clean that out and not actually treat that as an actual method in there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you can differentiate where it came from, you can store it and you can push it up there. So in theory, we can use the same thing for that. Again, I have a whole bunch of features here and I haven't written a line of code. Okay, because it's actually all there. You just had to look. And actually, that's what I was going to say during this talk. Sorry, but I'm just going to skip the talk. Um, and the other thing, too, that I started to realize is this. So a lot of us, you know, we think, okay, we need a class keyword. We need a method keyword. We need this. We need that. All these features. And if you actually think about it, these are all probably coming from Java. Maybe from C++, but, but Java is really sort of, uh, it's been taught a lot, and it sort of set the standard. And it really wasn't even there. I mean, Java, Java 1.0, I think, came out after. Java was in beta when Perl 5 first came out. So when Larry designed these features, there was no agreed upon everything must have a class uh, uh, keyword and all this kind of stuff like that. He worked with what he had. Uh, and, and, he, and he, well, he stole some Python too, but <laughs> he worked with what he had and what Guido had maybe left on the counter. I don't know. Um, and Ada, yeah, yeah. Um, so, but the key thing was, you know, respect the legacy. There's potentially a lot of good stuff out there that you can use. Um, and you just have to stop paying attention to the fancy new shiny stuff and have to start really digging into sometimes the ugly, sometimes the bad, sometimes it was written by the person who you think was a drooling idiot, but he, was probably, he or she was probably just like you, a programmer who had a job to do and they needed to get something done and that was the tool they chose to do. So, in conclusion though, I wanted to make one point. This was you, Larry, right? You said this. Laziness and patience and hu hubris. The three uh, 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 qualities of a good programmer. And uppercase Perl. Three qualities of a good lowercase Perl programmer. Okay, meaning the compiler. Meaning the core hacker. Is 
do the hard work. Okay, so Pete Martini in, in particular, he did the hard work. He dug down into it. It took me a while. I came around and I finally did do the hard work, but you have to do the hard work. You also have to have an incredible amount of patience to go through the core, to go through C5P, uh, to do all this stuff. But you have to be patient, you have to have persistence, and you have to have humility because there is nothing, nothing that will just basically knock you down in a second like programming in C in the Pro Core. It's, it's, it's extremely humbling experience. So as much as I agree with Larry on that, that first set, I think that from a core perspective, these are important things to have. Um, and with that, I will end it. Um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Questions, thoughts, Please observations? <laughs> Ask that man over there. <laughs> so I actually do have, I have, a, I have a reasonably good prototype built on some of those ideas. Um, and, and it's actually not a lot of code. Um, I've started uh, thinking about, too, something that I never really thought about uh, is that this also has to, has to have an API from the C side as well. You should be able to access all the things in the MOP and do all the things in the MOP from C entirely. Um, that one is going to be a little bit slower because I'm not a C programmer. I'm a relatively new C programmer. Uh, so exactly what a C API should look like or what it not look like, uh, we'll see, but <laughs> but it's it's it's. I actually feel like it's making pretty good progress. I have yet to build a syntax layer on top of it because that is a distraction. Um, but uh, but a lot of those features are in there. So when I don't know, I really can't say. Um, but uh, but soon <laughs> after Christmas. <laughs> um, anyone else? No, I went faster than I thought. Okay. Thank you.